Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. If you're looking at soil test results from your farm and it's from the top six inches, you may think things are pretty good, but there are some problems out in your field that may need to be addressed by looking at deeper soil tests. We'll talk about how to pull those deep tests and what you're going to learn. Another thing we'll talk about today is soybean harvest moisture. Now you may not have given this a lot of thought in the past, but this is a really big deal. It's free money you can earn on your farm by harvesting at the right time. We're going to talk about that today and talk through the economics. Well, a good way to earn a little more money on the farm is to keep our weed of the week under control. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed a little later in the show. First, here's our farm basics. One of the things we've been working on here at Ag PhD for the last few years is some products that can actually turn manure into compost much more quickly than the natural process. So today we wanted to talk just a little bit during our Farm Basics time about what is compost and why is it so much more beneficial than manure. What a great question, Brian, because we look at manure as being this desirable commodity for farmers to be able to apply because of the fertility value that's in the manure. However, there are a lot of negative things about handling straight manure. For example, you've got a lot of moisture in there, so you've got to haul around all this extra weight. Uh, so if you want to haul 10 tons, for example, half of it might just be water and not really doing you any good, so that's a waste. Another negative factor with manure is the amount of weed seed that's in it. Think about it, for the animals that are eating plants and eating feed sources, there's often weed seeds in there and it just passes right through the animal's digestive system. And now when you spread the manure, you have more weeds in the field. So we don't like that either. We also don't like that manure is really inconsistent. So as you're spreading it across the field, you're not getting exactly the same dose of nutrients everywhere you're spreading it. Uh, and there are several other things as well that are negative about manure, which could lead you to, well, I need to do something with this manure. Composting could be a great alternative. So how composting occurs is there are bacteria that will break that manure down. They'll turn a bunch of the carbon into carbon dioxide and there will be a release of carbon dioxide and a release of water. The pile shrinks down dramatically. During this whole process, the temperature in that pile will go a lot of times up to 130 to even 170 degrees. So during that conversion, it's going to kill weeds, insects, diseases, most pathogens that may be in there. So what you end up with is a lot more environmentally friendly product, a lot better product for fields. It's awesome and it doesn't have nearly the smell that manure has. So what, what's the potential downside with compost? Well, it's the fact that a lot of the nutrients in there are going to get released over a period of years. Rather, with manure, a lot of that nutrient availability happens in the first year. Now, hold up, Brian. This could be actually a positive. Let's say that I've got a hog unit on my farm, and I've got enough manure to spread over 500 acres, but I only farm 500 acres, and I think, wow, I don't want a full dose every year. Or maybe I've got more hogs than I have acres. Now what do I do? I've got to find somebody else to take some of that manure. By composting now, I'm going to have a lower amount of nutrients available this year, which means I could actually spread a little bit more of that compost out on my field. Well, that could be a positive benefit for me. Also, when you look at manure management programs, there's a limit to how many nutrients you can put on per year. If you're composting, that could free you up from a lot of those requirements and that you're not going to have that fast nutrient release. So yes, there's some trade-offs here. You are going to have a little less nutrient availability year one, but that might be a good thing in many cases. The normal process of composting will typically take three to six months. But what we've been working on at Ag PhD is we've now found a product, Decomp, that's actually able to turn manure into compost in about four to five weeks without all the turning that you usually have to do. In other words, flipping that pile over, introducing more oxygen. You don't have to do that with this particular product and all the different bacteria that are in there. So we're super excited about that. And again, we just wanted to talk today about why compost is important, why we feel a lot of farmers in the future are going to end up going to compost rather than manure, both in the feedlots and out in their fields. Well, compost certainly is a creative solution to many of the problems that manure presents. We'll give you some solutions to our Weed of the Week coming up later in the show. Out here, great yield, 
starts with great weed control. That's why I choose the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the system that makes the difference. Because only I know what it takes out here. Yields what it's all for. But keeping my fields clean all season, that's what it's all about. This is my field. Farmers across the country have put their confidence in the Roundup Ready Extend crop system. These are their experiences. Everything I've looked at that we have sprayed so far this year have had great control. The extend matics with vapor grip technology is just outstanding. I haven't seen anything that we've missed so far. We are very, very excited about the control on some of our biggest weed problems. I'm completely satisfied with the extend program. Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Avoid the V-shaped pattern of injury caused by chemical buildup in your booms. The Express end cap from Hypro eliminates the dead ends that lead to herbicide buildup and provides easy access to your booms, giving a complete flush between applications. Hypro, helping you spray better. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. out harvesting soybeans this fall, what are you going to look at when you haul those beans into the elevator? Chances are you might just look at the net total dollars in the end. But here's one of the things we want you to think about. What is that soybean moisture? If the moisture is too high, let's say it's at 14%, at you're going to get a dock and then what's going to happen when you show the check and the settlement sheet to your wife? She's probably going to be mad saying, well, you should have let the beans dry down a little more. But we want to tell you today why we don't want you to let those beans dry down. In fact, we want you to take them even wetter. Well, the most important thing about harvesting soybeans is to get started before they're down to 13%. If you don't start when they're at, say, 14% moisture, by the time you're done with that field, if you started at 13, they're probably going to be 11 or maybe even drier, depending on what the weather's like. If it's windy and hot and sunny and arid, well, yeah, it's going to take a lot of moisture out of those beans. So by starting just a little bit early, yes, you may be aggressive and that first field, you might get all done with that field before they're down to 13. That's fine. I'll take a little bit of a dock at the elevator versus what I'm going to lose if the beans get too dry. That's the whole thing here. What we're talking about today is the hidden yield loss of dry soybeans. Roughly what they figure is one and a half percent shrink per point. So if let's say I had 8% beans versus 13, that's 5% less than what I can bring them to the elevator for. 5% times 1.5%, that's 7.5% loss. Let's say I have 70 bushel beans. 70 bushel beans times 7.5%, how many bushels are we talking there? Roughly, just for easy math, let's say it's five bushels. Well, if it's $8 soybeans, that's $40 an acre. That's hidden yield loss, $40 an acre. If you got 1,000 acres, that's $40,000. That's a tremendous salary for a whole year, and you can make that up in just a week or two harvesting soybeans if you get them at the right moisture. You know, you look at what that shrink percentage is, and then you look at what you're going to get docked at the elevator, too. A lot of times, elevators will say, well, if you've got 14% moisture beans, I'm going to dock you 2% for every 1% of moisture extra we've got, or I'm going to dock you 4% when we get up to 15%. A lot of times, when they get even higher moistures, they're going to dock more. I'm not saying to harvest beans at 16%, and Brian's not either. We don't want to have super, super wet beans, because that can cause its own problems. As soon as those pods open really nicely and we don't have to grind things through the combine, 
14 percent is a nice moisture percentage to start at. You can dry that 14 down to 13 in your bins with some air. You could also uh, dry it down if it's you know 13 and a half no problem that's going to go really easy. It's just the fact of if you get way too wet yeah you're taking a lot of risk. Okay here's where I'm going to completely disagree with Darren. I want you to harvest at 15 or 16 percent moisture and have some type of system like AgriDry right on your grain bins if you've got lots of acres. Now if you only have a few acres and you can get them all right in that 12 to 14 percent range, great do that, okay? But what I am saying is if you've got lots of acres, it's going to take you a while to harvest. Harvest at least some at 15, 16 percent moisture just to get started, throw them in the bin. And while Darren mentioned, yes you can take that moisture out pretty easily with air, you're not going to be able to do that manually. You're going to have to have an automatic system to do that. You can look at the very simple charts, they're all over the internet, just showing you what's your humidity and what's your temperature. And at the right point, yes, absolutely you can pull moisture out. For that matter, you can put moisture back in. So these systems, these newer systems for grain bins, they're awesome. We have some on our farm, you should too. I was going to make that point too, Brian, if you harvest beans too dry, which you will, you're going to have some beans that get too dry. This is an opportunity to put some moisture back in there legally and doing it the right way uh, just by blowing some humid air through the crop. Uh, there's no issue with that at all. That would happen out in the field by nature too. So you have to look at those kinds of factors when you're looking at soybeans, trying to get the most in your combine and trying to get the most in your wallet too at the end of the year. You've got to get started on the early side. There's a lot of loss there by harvesting beans too dry. So get started early this year on your farm. Hey, one last thing Darren mentioned about these wet beans. Okay, even if there is a little bit of dock, look at how much that dock is. Yeah, so what if it's 2%? If you gained 1.5%, you're only out a half a percent. It's no big deal. It's much better than losing a full 1.5%, even at 12% moisture beans. Run the math. Look at your elevator and what their docks are and everything else, but figure 1.5% shrink or 1.5% gain, and I would challenge you, I'll bet you that 14% moisture beans are going to make you more net dollars than 12% moisture beans if you haul them into the elevator. So it's something I really want you to think about, and it's something I need to challenge you with, because I'm going to guess your dad and your grandpa said, hey, start at 13%, and then we're going to work our way down. I would tell you, we want to start at 13% and work our way up or put it in another way, start at 15 or 16% moisture. We want those beans a little on the wet side. You're gonna make more net dollars than having them too dry. One other thing that'll make you more money on your farm is controlling our weed of the week. Can you identify this week's weed? No two seasons are the same. Each brings its own set of challenges. And you've seen a few. So many threats, and not one single thing can be taken for granted. In the fight against the unpredictable, the Acceleron portfolio provides coverage on four fronts. Fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, and bioenhancers. Rise stronger with one simple decision. Are you looking for an easy way to apply dry powdered products to your stored grain? Do you want to use the applicator recommended by industry leaders for products like Diacon D and other dry powder products? Changing Time CT applicators successfully apply a diversity of products quickly, easily, and accurately. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, inoculants, fertilizers, and other dry products. For commercial use or on the farm, you need the applicator industry leaders are using. CT applicators for the changing times. And how about the big man, Pro Germinator? Yeah, this guy's got some experience in the field. But look at his stats. You can't argue with those kind of results. You're right. I know a lot of teams wishing their phosphorus player had those kind of numbers. Right, but this guy's not just phosphorus. He's got the nitrogen, the potassium, the micros. All those just add up to his phosphorus game. And his game is good. Morton is eager to make the building you've always dreamed of a reality. Visit us online at mortonbuildings.com. With the success of the Case IH Diger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, 
It's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us. Because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, with less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. The Guardian Air Twin Spray Nozzle from Hypro produces a twin spray pattern with air inducted droplets for superior coverage, even in dense canopies. Be effective and efficient with your spray application this season with the Guardian Air Twin. Hypro, helping you spray better. Do you need to pull deep soil samples or not? Well, the answer is yes. That's very simple, Brian. We do need to look at what's going on deeper in our soil, but how deep is actually going to be important and relevant to the crops that we're growing? That and, may be and, a different discussion. And how often? I mean, how often do you want a guy to pull deep soil samples? Well, look at what we're doing. Uh, most of the time with current farming practices, we're manipulating the top few inches of soil, maybe eight inches of soil at the most. And, and we're turning that over with tillage or we're growing roots that are primarily going to be in the top six inches of soil. We're applying nutrients to the top of the soil or maybe we're tilling them in five or six inches deep. All of what we're doing is up top. So it's really important that every year we're soil sampling, but down deep, how often are we changing the 12 to 24 inch soil profile? Not very often. Okay, before we go any further, you made the comment, every year soil sample. You don't have to soil sample every single year. On our farm we are because we're making dramatic changes. We're trying to take yields up to incredibly high levels compared to where we are today. I'm not saying we're doing it instantaneously, but anyway, because of the major changes we're doing, we're sampling every year. If all you're doing is maintaining things, you can probably soil sample once every two to four years, don't you think? Well, for most farmers, that's what they're going to do. And the reason why is they're going to make the choice. Uh, this is what I want to afford. I want to afford to be able to do it this often. I don't want to spend that money. I'd rather use that money for something else in between. I'm going to argue that you're going to see some value by doing it if you're making the changes that Brian's talking about. And if you're actually willing to change on your farm. If you say, I'm not going to do anything different. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just wondering, do I put on 100 pounds of nitrogen or only 90 this year? Well, Okay, then, then yeah, you, the don't have to, you don't have to soil sample very often. But if you say, you know, I'm really curious, if boron is low, I'm putting it on. Or if copper is low, I'm putting it on, then by all means, you want to soil sample more often. The deep soil profile, though, you're not changing very much very often, unless you change your farming methods and you say, I'm going to go to strip till, I'm going to start putting nutrients in a foot deep or something like that, yeah, or do some deep, deep tillage. Well, then you may you may want to do it more often. Yeah, but let's just say you're out there strip tilling. And like for us, we put a lot of fertility 8 to 10 inches deep. Well, now instead of a 0 to 6 inch core, we're just going to pull a 0 to 12 inch core. And then for that deeper soil sample, the one we're talking about today, 12 to 24 inches deep, and you can separate that however you want. You can pull, let's say, 12 to 18 and 18 to 24, or you could just pull a 12 to 24. That's up to you. But the point is, you're not going to change that very often. You don't have to sample that very often, but you should sample that occasionally just to find out what's going on. So on our farm, for example, we aren't gonna do every single grid point every year really deep, but we'll take just a few grid points in just a few fields every year and find out what is happening in that 12 to 24 inch depth. Here, we'll give you just some examples of some things that we have learned from those deep soil samples. One thing would be soil pH. When we think about, oh boy, my pH is really low. I need to get a whole bunch of lime out here. And then you start looking deeper in the profile and you realize, wow, my pH is actually seven down deep or it might even be a little higher than that. What am I doing? You've got to evaluate what your practices are that are making that pH drop into the fives in the top part of your soil. Because if you just went out and did some deep tillage and mixed it all up, you get your pH right back to a, a good point in the mid sixes. So those are some of the things that I would, that's probably the first one that I'd look at is what's my deep soil pH and uh, what am I doing to affect that up top? Now, the other thing, Darren, though, is let's say we do have a really high pH down below. That might indicate, hey, there's a drainage issue and that could work its way all the way up. So I might look at that and if I see an 8 pH down really deep, I'm going to go, ooh, boy, I see my salt level high, my sulfur level high, my boron, all these things that should be leachable, they're high, my pH is high. I got a drainage issue. I now have figured it out just by the soil test, so I need to get my drainage evaluated. Well, yes, and you're going to see a compaction layer as well many times. So as you're going down and probing deep into the soil, you may hit 10 inches and you just can't get it through there. There's a really rock hard layer. 
that should tell you what your plant roots are going to be able to do. If you can't, as a, a strong human being, push down through that, how is a tiny little root system going to get through that? And one of the yeah. first things that we learned when we did some deep soil sampling is, wow, we've got a lot of moisture down deep, and we're suffering from moisture up top. So compaction may be another thing that you discover on your journey here with the deep soil test. Well, the other thing that we saw on our farm, very low organic matter levels and very low fertility levels in that 12 to 24 inch range. What's that tell you? That tells you there's not a lot of root growth down there. So that's when we started addressing some of our compaction issues. We've started building that deeper profile. We've also injected manure down, clear down to 20 inches deep in some fields. That has really helped. Gotten a lot more roots down there, helped build the organic matter, helped build the soil fertility because on our farm we don't have irrigation. When we get dry in the top 12 inches, guess what? If we have moisture and nutrients down in that next 12 inches, we're going to have a lot better yield. And you know what, there are a lot more things that I'm going to be looking at in that deep soil sample. We're going to go more in depth on that coming up in September's Ag PhD Insider Magazine. For more information on that, uh, you can just go to our website, agphdinsider.com, uh, and sign up for the magazine if you would like, and check that out. But you don't have to go anywhere to learn more about our Weed of the Week. It's coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> is an extremely common one and you've probably seen it in your garden, in your yard, or even in your fields. It's prostrate pigweed. All right, anytime the word prostrate is in there, basically what that means is it's something that's going to stay low to the ground. So you're not going to see this weed popping up above the crop late in the season or anything like that, but that doesn't mean it can't rob yield on your farm. So we want to talk about the control methods today. All right, number one control method for prostrate pigweed is get great crop canopy. I don't care where it's at, if it's in your landscaping, in your yard, in your garden, in a field. If you've got great crop canopy, we normally don't see prostrate pigweed getting started. But you have to get to canopy weed free first. Right. So let's start right from the beginning. All right, so I would suggest use a good pre-emerge herbicide. In soybeans, where we most often see this, I would say, you want to start with the three pre program. We talk about it all the time, Metribuzin plus a PPO, either Valor or Authority, plus a yellow, that's Trifluralin, Sonalan, or Prowl. In corn, there are a lot of good pre-emerge products you may use. It's going to be one of those products that is a combination of a grass and broadleaf killer if you want the best results on prostrate pigweed, something like Verdict or Resicor. However, if you're in a situation where you say, I'm in conventional corn, I really have to get the grass under control. Is there a pre I could use? Yeah, I just use a full rate of harness or surpass. They would be the best. Yeah, but they're not going to be 100% on prostrate pigweed. That's why you might want to spike that then. If you're going full rate grass killer, spike it with a sharpen or something like that. Well, you can control them post-emerge. There's a lot of good post-emerge options in corn. I really like status. That'd be my number one choice. You could also do something like one of the HPPDs and add a half pound of atrazine to it if that's allowed in your rotation. That would be an excellent method of control too. All right, in wheat, start with sharpen, follow with husky. Oh, and don't forget post-emerge in soybeans. I really like Roundup or Liberty or one of the new Dicamba products that extend soybeans. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week, Prostrate Pigweed, but stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. Your planter is the single most important piece of equipment on your farm because without a uniform stand, you can't reach maximum yield. That's why Harvest International set out to design a planter that takes advantage of the newest innovations in planter technology. Built tough for high speed and integrated with the latest precision enhancements, Harvest International planters ensure every seed you plant today puts more in your bin at harvest. Harvest International, planting the future. 
Introducing the Soilmax ZD48, the newest addition to the Soilmax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The Soilmax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. At Estes Performance Concaves, we know how valuable your time is at harvest. That's why we designed the new XPR Concave System. The XPR System is the number one performance concave system on the market, surpassing the rest in both speed and efficiency, ensuring every last grain from your field gets into your tank. Plus, XPR Concaves work for all row crops. No more changing concaves, meaning you have less downtime. Take back your bushels this harvest. Get Estes Performance Concaves in your combine today. This agro liquid line is something special. A lot of really impressive playmakers. Take a look at Sure K. This guy is an enigma. But wrap your head around the exceptionally high plant response when compared to conventional potassium sources, the research proven plant availability, plus flexible application options and mixing capabilities. Really stellar performance stats. Sure K is a true standout, and that's a winning goal on any field. Are you looking to make a career in an ag-related field? The Responsible Nutrient Management Foundation is pleased to offer a $2,500 scholarship for students enrolled in an agricultural program for the 2018-2019 school year. The goal with this scholarship is to further the education of students who understand the importance of proper stewardship and responsible nutrient management for agriculture and society as a whole. To learn more and apply, visit rnmf.org scholarship before October 15th. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. With the success of the Case IH Tiger Quad Track and Magnum Road Track tractors, it's no secret why Case IH is the leader of the track. So it wasn't surprising when the competition started imitating us. Because Case IH offered the first five axle design to give you more power to the ground, with less berming and compaction, all to help you be more productive. Still, we're flattered. In fact, if we weren't already red, <laughs> we'd be blushing. If there's still corn growing in your area, you've got some homework to do. I'll explain on today's Iron Talk. Getting your planter set just right and seeing each plant emerge at about the same time definitely sets you up for higher yields. At the Ag PhD Field Day this summer, almost every one of the corn yield champs from across the country made this point over and over again, crediting even emergence as a key to their success. It's the attention to these seemingly little details that really sets growers apart. Spacing, avoiding doubles and triples, as well as how even your emergence was, will still be evident in your fields right now. I encourage you, get out in your fields and check it out. Look at the consistency of your stand and the consistency of the size of the ears and ear placement. When you see those smaller ears, there's a great chance that it stems back to uneven emergence and an error made by you or your planter this spring. The same could be said about uneven height now. You can trace it back to a planter problem. This means you've got some work ahead of you before you plant your next crop. Fixing those problems on your planter is a job that'll pay you back thousands of dollars for the hours of work that it takes this fall and winter to get it set just right. So get out, walk your cornfields before harvest, look for unevenness, and address it with your residue management system this fall, and your planter set up in operation going into the spring. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. If you ever have questions for Darren or me, we would invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD radio show. We're on each weekday on Sirius XM channel 147 and we do take your live phone calls. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.